So thank you um, so much. Thank you all for being here today. And thank you, Fred, for the kind introduction. Uh, Fred and I have known each other for many years, and I do so admire your leadership, uh, Fred. I congratulate your outstanding work and those of your colleagues for making the Atlantic Council an extraordinary epicenter for engagement on international affairs. I cannot think of a better host for this important and timely discussion today. And I also want to take a moment to applaud our South Korean colleagues uh, who are here and back in South Korea for the great strides which they have made in the historic third ever meeting between the leaders of North and South Korea. I met uh, Fred um, almost 35 years ago, and um, I had just published a book uh, entitled Nuclear Peril, The Politics of Proliferation. The theory of my book, a 1982 book, uh, was that uh, President Carter had made a mistake in agreeing to sell 38 uh, tons of um, uranium to India without full scope safeguards uh, after the um, Russians, uh, the Soviet Union had invaded Afghanistan. Um, I was concerned, obviously, that uh, Pakistan uh, would respond in kind. Um, the book also dealt with the Israeli raid on the Osirak reactor uh, in Iraq, which uh, obviously was being used as a nuclear bomb factory. These facilities can generate electricity or uh, nuclear bomb making material, uh, and the Israelis moved in to destroy that facility. Uh, and it was in the context of, uh, of the US, USSR nuclear arms race, the vertical arms race between uh, those two countries that was obscuring uh, the horizontal nuclear race as country after country would seek to gain their own nuclear weapons capacity. So it was a book about uh, Iran, about Iraq, about Korea, about other countries, uh, beginning in the early 1980s, that would have ambitions to have their own nuclear weapons program. Uh, and so um, I came to be friends with uh, Fred around that time and the summit between uh, Mikhail Gorbachev uh, and President Reagan in 1986, uh, another historic moment uh, where finally the two superpowers uh, were going to come to the table. Uh, and so ultimately, uh, that is what we are trying to encourage. Uh, we're trying to encourage negotiation. We're trying to negotiate uh, a way to resolve these issues. Uh, each country is uh, given that choice, but ultimately we're either going to uh, know each other or we're going to exterminate each other. We're either going to live together or we're going to die together. Those are the choices which we have to make on an ongoing basis uh, in each and every one of these situations. And the inter-Korean summit at the Peace House was by all accounts a very welcome turn towards engagement and diplomacy. The Panmunjom Declaration includes important commitments to improve North-South relations, reduce tension, and formally end the Korean War. These outcomes are welcome first steps, but if we are to succeed in reaching a durable solution, we must view these leader-level engagements as the beginning of what will be a long diplomatic process and not an end unto themselves. As I think my South Korean colleagues would agree, much work 
lies before us. Even with the positive developments, North Korea remains a serious and ever worsening threat to the United States, to our allies and partners in the region and to its own people. Its engineers and scientists at present continue to work unabated and unmonitored on nuclear-tipped intercontinental ballistic missiles. This threat is real, but it cannot be solved with force. I have long called for a diplomatic approach to the crisis in North Korea. This past August, as the lead Democrat on the East Asia Subcommittee, I led a congressional delegation uh, to Korea and China and to Japan. Uh, I asked Senator Chris Van Hollen of Maryland, Senator Jeff Merkley of uh, Oregon and Congresswoman Ann Wagner from Missouri to accompany me on my trip. Uh, and we went and met with President Moon. We traveled to the border of China uh, in North Korea as the first ever U.S. delegation to visit Dan Dong, the major uh, point of commerce between uh, North Korea and China, uh, so that we could discuss and witness oil tanks going across the bridge from uh, 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 China into North Korea. That's just last August. Uh, we met with our generals, we met with our admirals working in the region and with our diplomats. Uh, and then uh, last October, uh, I met uh, with President Trump in the White House uh, before his trip to South Korea to underscore the importance of strengthening economic sanctions and engaging in dialogue. Uh, I told him uh, that uh, there is only a diplomatic resolution to this issue. There is no military resolution of this issue, which would not turn catastrophic very quickly. Uh, and I also told him that talks in and of themselves are not a concession. I made the case to the President that direct and unconditional talks and tough economic sanctions were the only way he could start making deals that first freeze and then roll back Kim's nuclear program. This is the only way for us to ultimately eliminate North Korea's nuclear weapons and ballistic missile programs. Since then, the President, thankfully, has embraced the diplomatic approach. Now, I will admit his embrace has been a bit unorthodox, but I applaud him for taking my advice to heart, and I hope that he will also heed my advice that success will take time and requires looking back at the arc of history. After all, Kim Jong-un is as well looking back at history. Like his father before him, he seeks to emulate countries that successfully gained acceptance as nuclear weapon states. Countries like China, India, and Pakistan who raced towards nuclear weapons, endured the international community's ensuing consternation and sanctions, but eventually reemerged onto the world stage as more powerful players with an acceptance of their nuclear weapons program by the rest of the world, de facto. At the same time, he is keenly aware of the fate suffered by other strong men that either did not complete nuclear weapons programs or negotiated them away, like Iraq, where Saddam Hussein agreed to host United Nations weapons inspectors and still face an invasion that deposed him, or Muammar Gaddafi in Libya, who agreed to dismantle his nuclear weapons program only to later face a popular uprising and a NATO intervention that ultimately led to his brutal death. In 2011, 
Events in Libya confirmed North Korea's deep-seated fears. Its reaction was telling when it stated that the Libya deal was nothing but, quote, an invasion tactic to disarm the country. And indeed, numerous deals with North Korea from the agreed framework to the commitments laid out in the 2005 joint statement to the Leap Day deal all fell apart, likely driven both by longstanding enmities on the one hand, but also by these lingering insecurities. Many point to these examples as cause for pessimism. Maybe so. But history also shows that there is still reason to be hopeful. That perspective and events do change, and the unexpected can happen. On October 12, 1986, an adversary to America walked into a leader-level summit prepared to do what everyone assumed and expected he would not and could not possibly do. At the Reykjavik summit, Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev was in fact serious about eliminating nuclear weapons. And that conversation helped end what long had been an intractable arms race between two nuclear powers. It seems reasonable to us now, but at the time, most were incredulous. So while the challenge to a lasting agreement with North Korea are great, we should not abandon optimism. Nevertheless, a fundamental question is whether this time will be different from our previous efforts with the Kim regime. Is, is Kim Jong-un different from his father, different from his grandfather, or is he using the same playbook? Have our sanctions compelled a weakened North Korea to the table? Or, with a completed ICBM, is Kim Jong-un negotiating from a position of strength? The more fundamental question is more within our control to address. What have we learned from the past, and what must we do differently this time to ensure success? So if you'll permit me, I'd like to share my thoughts about the roadmap that lies ahead. It is essential that we view this as the beginning of what will and must necessarily be a very long process. Despite all the recent good news, a phased approach that will play out over time is the only way all sides will overcome the trust deficits forged by war and hardened by decades of hostility. A long process does not mean we think we can wait to address the North Korea threat, but because denuclearization, however defined, simply cannot be solved overnight or in one meeting. So while we all look forward to an upcoming summit between President Trump and Kim Jong-un that will be history-making, we must ensure that meaningful talks continue following the summit and the tangible progress continues to be made. To do that, there are specific sticking points that must be addressed. After all, the devil is in the details, and we have seen similar promises from North Korea before. First, we don't yet have agreement on what denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula means. It seems exceedingly unlikely that North Korea will unilaterally disarm. Highly unlikely. Will they expect an end to our extended nuclear deterrent, to our alliance with South Korea itself? What weapons and programs will be included in any denuclearization process? Just North Korea's nuclear weapons are fissile material production programs are its chemicals and biological weapons programs as well. Delivery systems, ICBMs only, or short-range ballistic missiles as well. And how do we deal with North Korea's world-renowned space program? Second, what timelines will be acceptable to all parties? The Pan Munjom Declaration suggests that there are differing expectations 
regarding the timeline for sanctions relief. What milestones must North Korea first reach? We have not been applying pressure for the sake of pressure. Our sanctions are meant to both degrade North Korea's ability to threaten the United States and the region with its weapons and to denuclearize North Korea through negotiations. As we have not yet achieved either of these goals, it is too early to tell whether our efforts have been successful. So it is also too early to remove the pressure. We will need to keep the pressure focused but nimble so that when, not if, North Korea backslides, we will be able to calibrate based upon a demonstration of progress. Third, assuming we can reach agreement on the definition of denuclearization and we can agree how to sequence tangible steps towards denuclearization with sanctions relief, how will we conduct the verification process? Verifying that North Korea has truly relinquished its nuclear weapons program, the warheads themselves, the facilities, manufacturing weapons grade nuclear materials and related components, and not stashed extra warheads deep in secluded bunkers or mountain hideaways safe from the prying eyes of weapons inspectors will be a major challenge. These obstacles are surmountable, however. And as the administration moves towards the Trump-Kim summit, there are some guiding principles it should follow to maximize the chance of a lasting agreement acceptable to us and to our allies. As we approach the U.S.-North Korean summit, I see three crucial do's, each with a corresponding don't. First, do focus on the threat at hand, North Korea's nuclear warheads and the ICBMs that carry them. North Korea's growing ability to hold the U.S. homeland at risk is the driving factor in the escalating crisis. Many will be tempted to focus on any win in what has long been a losing situation. And I believe there is a real likelihood we will see some big, quote, wins at the upcoming summit. After all, the Kim regime is masterful at using propaganda to avoid meaningfully rolling back its nuclear program. But we cannot afford to be sidetracked, to lose sight of what really is America's ultimate security goal. So to the administration, don't fall for North Korea's inevitable theatrics and false concessions. Kim Jong-un will try to distract. We need to be careful not to give Kim too much credit, but we have seen this before. Kim Jong-un seeks to market North Korea as a responsible nuclear weapon state by forswearing nuclear and missile tests. Yet, this is not the first time that North Korea has agreed to a moratorium on nuclear and long-range missile tests. For example, in 2008, to much fanfare, North Korea imploded the cooling tower at Yongbyon. Except that the cooling tower was not a necessary component for North Korea's production of fissile material. As you know, North Korea was able to accelerate its program. And in recent weeks, North Korea has promised to close its nuclear test site and open it to inspectors. Is this a welcome development? Yes. Would U.S. and international experts learn something by visiting the facility? Of course. But while the imagery would be great, would we be achieving our objectives given that the test site may no longer be usable anyway? And North Korea has already conducted six nuclear tests. We would be wise 
to think of these examples when weighing what North Korea is really willing to concede during negotiations. For every concession, we must ask ourselves whether it is truly an irreversible step towards denuclearization and reciprocate accordingly. This requires a thoughtful look at the diplomatic tools we already possess and new creative ones we could develop. Second, do stay in lockstep with our ally, South Korea, and help build on the foundation laid by President Moon and his advisors. North Korea and China stand to benefit from driving a wedge between the United States and its allies. We must continue to work together shoulder to shoulder, planning our next steps to maximize our leverage and ensure to avoid opening gaps that North Korea can exploit. But there are things to avoid. Do not lose sight of the bigger strategic picture. American forces in the region are and have been a stabilizing presence. We welcome the recent Blue House statement that U.S. troops, troop levels on the peninsula are an alliance issue independent of any potential peace agreement that might be signed. The United States is committed to defend South Korea from attack, and we should ensure that the capabilities to uphold that promise are retained. And we must closely coordinate with the Japanese. America's word to defend its allies must not lose its meaning. And third, do build American diplomatic capability and infrastructure, because diplomacy is a team sport. And no matter what commitments leaders make, it is only through a well-staffed and resourced professional diplomatic corps that it becomes a reality. The State Department must have the resources it needs to conduct American foreign policy around the globe, and especially with regard to Asia and North Korea. But at present, the United States has no special envoy or special representative for North Korean policy. We still don't have a U.S. ambassador to South Korea more than a year into the Trump administration. We still don't have a, confer a confirmed Assistant Secretary for East Asian and Pacific Affairs. We still don't have a special envoy for North Korean human rights issues. We no longer have a sanctions coordinator at the State Department. The State Department is facing drastic cuts to its budget resources. Going into presidential talks without a fully staffed State Department means there are fewer resources dedicated to building a diplomatic toolkit, fewer opportunities to build pressure, and fewer people holding North Korea accountable for progress moving forward. Holding North Korea accountable will require sustained garden tending. Absent this, there will, how will our nation ever be able to ensure that anything Kim Jong-un promises becomes a reality. Don't succumb to the illusion that it is possible to strike a grand bargain that solves the problem overnight. As former Secretary Condoleezza Rice said, do not, quote, try to negotiate the details with Kim Jong-un. Diplomacy and sustained engagement even if launched in a somewhat unorthodox fashion, is our only option for peace. We cannot squander this opportunity by sidelining the expertise of those inside and outside of government who have spent their careers trying to understand the nuances of nuclear negotiations with the Kim regime. There are still many unanswered questions, but diplomacy, Back by pressure is the only way to solve the crisis. Should talks collapse, however, a preventative military attack still will not be justified, and a failed summit cannot become a stepping stone 
for war, preventive or otherwise, initiated by the United States. Victor Cha recently said that if a Trump-Kim summit does not go well, quote, the only thing beyond the summit is a cliff. We need to avoid that outcome at all costs. And should it be necessary, we would need to be ready with additional measures to further increase economic pressure on the Kim regime, to tighten the pressure even more on the Kim regime, to cut off their access to the rest of the world's economy even more if they are unwilling to sit and to negotiate a resolution of this issue. China, the primary enabler of North Korea, may well decide to reduce its cooperation with us in enforcing sanctions uh, which would ease the pressure on North Korea. But to do so would set back our efforts to resolve the crisis. This morning, I have presented a roadmap for de-escalating the North Korean threat. For decades, my work has focused on safeguarding our planet from catastrophic nuclear war. As Albert Einstein once said, peace cannot be kept by force. It can only be achieved by understanding. We have an obligation to American families, to service members, and to our allies to say unequivocally that we did everything in our power to address North Korea's dangerous behavior without resorting to armed conflict. This is the pathway for promoting understanding that must be followed to ensure a more peaceful, prosperous world now and in the years ahead. I thank the Atlanta Council for this very important uh, gathering. And I thank, all, I thank all of the leaders who are here uh, and back on the Korean Peninsula who are working hard in order to find a peaceful resolution uh, of this incredibly important issue that goes right to the heart of whether or not we are going to have a nuclear nonproliferation regime that is enforceable across the planet. And I think that ultimately what the President is talking about in uh, potentially pulling out of the Iran nuclear agreement would be a huge mistake uh, if he believes in any way that he would have credibility sitting at the table with Kim. We must honor the agreements which we have already entered into as a nation if we expect to have credibility when we sit at, the, at a table with the next leader that we hope to persuade will enter into negotiations with us on a verifiable basis with the international energy, with the IAEA able to enforce um, uh, those, um, uh, uh, those uh, measures. Um, Saudi Arabia right now uh, is seeking to uh, negotiate a deal with the uh, United States on a uh, one, two, three agreement for nuclear reprocessing, plutonium reprocessing and uranium enrichment equipment on their soil. The United States must have credibility. Uh, we must have a consistent uh, nuclear nonproliferation policy. That is what I call for in my 1982 book, Nuclear Peril, the Politics of Proliferation. So this is ultimately the historic moment. And President Trump has an opportunity with Kim to begin to reverse this, this whole trajectory of nuclear proliferation. Our hopes and prayers go with him, and my hopes are uh, that this agreement can be reached and that we can begin to see a world where the Korean Peninsula is denuclearized, that we have true peace which is reached between the North and the South. Thank you all so much for having me here.